Hello everybody, welcome to another video. Today it is the 5th of October. Today we're looking at really important updates from Donetsk then also in Kursk. We have the movement of the 47th Mechanized Brigade northwards away from their rear positions in Donetsk to the Glushkova district. We'll look at that by the end of the video. I want to start off by discussing Ukrainian efforts that have ramped up last month to increase the amount of trenches they have built vertically on the border between Dnipro and Donetsk Oblast. This is really, really important for the long term after the Battle of Pokrovsk and after a lot of the current clashes that we see, whether it be around Selidove, which we're going to zoom in on over here so you can see whether it be in Selidove or the Vavta River. All of this is currently in focus, but it really is important to see what Ukraine does on the rear because sooner or later, this will become the next line of contact and the Ukrainians in a lot of ways, they need to be prepared. If you may uh, recall, the Ukrainians really started their wide-scale efforts to build trenches in the Donetsk Oblast past the 2014 lines that were then, you know, built up and propped up all the way up to 2022. So that was an earlier phase of Ukrainian trench building that you see a lot over here in yellow. You can see it on the map where I'm hovering over south of Avdivka and basically along the entire 2014 ceasefire line. Around the end of 2023, that's when Zelensky gave the order to really ramp up the amount of fortifications built. And it really began to manifest itself west of Avdivka with a lot of the villages that were fought over past that particular city around January of 2024. And now it's been 10 months since January and you could see on the map, whether it be in the darker yellow or lighter yellow colors, these are actually outdated. The Ukrainians have built even more defenses. I'm, I'm gonna export the uh, really good work done by uh, all the accounts that I've linked here and also in the description that are tracking every single individual fortification, whether it be a trench, an anti-tank ditch, dragon's teeth, it's really impressive. And it gives us a really good idea of what the Ukrainians have in store. So the latest development is that the Ukrainians are building defenses 40 kilometers to the west of the current line of contact. And that will be past Pokrovsk. The Russians themselves, their objective here, because Pokrovsk is really defended by three layers at this point. There are three more layers of defense before you enter into Pokrovsk directly. The first layer you can see pretty uh, palpably over here on the map in red. This is a line that runs originally along the highway over here in the top right corner of your screen, runs along the line of contact in areas like Hrodivka. A lot of it is cluttered by units and logos, but you can see it pretty much over here on the map. It's the nexus of the current fighting. And then also a bit to the west, you have the southern flank near Lysivka, Shevchenko. So that is one part of it. Then you have the sort of outcropping over here, I'm going to mark it in red, which protects the northeastern flank of Pokrovsk and then gets connected to Mirohrad and the rest of the ring outside of the actual perimeter of Pokrovsk. And then concerning Pokrovsk directly, you could see over here, its inner circle is also defended basically 360 degrees. So it really is a formidable defensive structure. And now you have the men needed to man those trenches actually due to the round of reinforcements that came in from the 93rd Mechanized Brigade. At least half of that unit has been sent in to hold the line and make sure that any effort towards Pokrovsk will be drawn out, whether it be in the suburbs or in the city itself. Also, due to the fact that the Russians did not invest in advancing northwards here, uh, just to the northeast of Pokrovsk towards the Donetsk Ring Road, uh, it's got, given the Ukrainians several months in the summertime to build even more defenses than you see on my map over here. So the Ukrainians actually have even more density to the northeast of Pokrovsk in this region, and that will make it more difficult for the Russians to start offensive activities over here right now. And I don't see any indication of them doing so, just based on where the units are placed and the fact that they really are focusing wholeheartedly on efforts southwards, which have been really successful. But uh, yeah, it is interesting that they decided not to go with uh, this particular direction because uh, a couple of months ago, I laid out scenarios that could have been utilized by the Russians to overcome the Ukrainian defense line here just south of the highway. But it appears due to the fact that there already was a solid base of trenches here. And also you could see that the X marked is on a really high elevated hill. The Russians just decided not to go for that. 
And so they found a more relevant part of the front line to advance through. And at the south of Pokrovsk, it actually makes more sense because then you're connecting the operations to other fronts like Kurakove, whereas further north, it's not really connected to any uh, really contested part of the front line at the present moment. Uh, so yeah, that's just some of the rationale behind all of the recent movements. In terms of what the Ukrainians have in store, uh, the Ukrainians, they recently published photos from the 23rd engineering positional regiment this is a part of the ukrainian support forces this is a really important ancillary force to the armed forces of ukraine uh, there are a lot of different components to it it's not just engineering you have uh, cbrn you have uh, radio contacts topography all of that so within the engineering and uh, support element of this entire uh, you know structure of the support forces you have one support battalion, you have three centers as they're referred to. I don't know the size of these. I don't know how large an engineering regiment or an engineering center is supposed to be. I just know their names. Two engineering regiments and then six engineering or pontoon brigades. And so those are substantial uh, numbers. Uh, maybe not substantial, but multiple. It's not just one unit that is directly related to engineering. There are several of them that are dispersed along the entire defensive work. I just don't know what that would entail like how many troops are in each one how many vehicles have allotted uh how many dragons teeth are provided to each one i have no clue so i'm going to try to do some research on that but at least one of those regiments is involved now in building large-scale fortifications on the border between donetsk and dnipro this is important uh, of course for strategic reasons you don't want to have a situation where the russians overrun some of ukraine's most dense defenses and then are left in open areas where they can advance along roads and push even deeper into dnipro oblast itself threatening pavlohrad in the long term also for political reasons because the russians haven't even uh, formally annexed dnipro and if they sense that there was an opportunity to actually enter in maybe then they would change their opinion on that and so as we zoom in, the Ukrainians are now beginning wide-scale building, specifically between Stovyanka and Mezhova. You can see that over here marked with uh, this red line. And it makes sense because they're connected by highway. So you want to ensure that the entire line is protected. And you can see some of that forming here, but these are earlier trenches. I'm going to upload the, the KMZ file for the newer iteration by the next video. So that will be uh, very useful for uh, um, you know illustrative purposes. But that's not it. It's not just over here. And if we're measuring the distances for a second, you can see that it is about, what is that, like 42 kilometers away from the current Russian bulge near Lysivka. Further south, you also have defenses being built around Novopavlivka. This isn't really, this is a good idea because Novopavlivka is a really important conduit between the rear and Donetsk itself. There is a horizontal line that runs through Andrivka, and Andrivka is going to become a really important Ukrainian center of gravity. In the coming months, as you know, a lot of it has shifted away from Pokrovsk and Kurakova due to their proximity to the front line. So, of course, the Ukrainians had time to build these horizontal defenses, uh, but those don't have much of an impact right now because you can see that the, like, the majority of the attacks are coming in from the east. So there does need to also be a vertical component, and that would be along the same highway extending northwards from here, from Dachnia all the way to Novopavlivka. There probably is a presence of the 148th Artillery Brigade some of it is in Donetsk over here and has a lot of their uh, batteries. Others are in Kursk, so it's sort of splits. But yeah, it is also a very important artillery garrison. The Ukrainians are also building defenses around Udachnya, and this is important because it will serve as an intermediary line. Because you have the uh, sort of westernmost ring of Pokrovsk over here, which is really well built, as you can see, and there are a lot of... Uh, islands i would call them you could look at the map and individual forts they could be connected if needed or if they want to remain isolated on a top of a hill and the focus will be shifted towards making them more structured with concretes and uh you know more deep in some cases because again you want to avoid all of them being destroyed by fabs immediately or odavs whatever it may be between that line and the line that is being built around uh Slovyanka, Mezhova, that is around 23 kilometers. You don't want to seed, or not necessarily seed, but you don't want to leave open all of the hinterlands in between. So then the intermediary line right on the border, which would be Udachnya and Serhivka, that seems like a good idea. There is a uh, local road over here, paved, that is connecting all the villages 
in a vertical manner. And then the Russians, they would, uh, in the scenario where they had already captured Pokrovsk, they would have the ability to utilize the rail line and the windbreaks. So that's a higher elevated area. So you'd want to have a uh, very strong, solid obstacle in the way to prevent that from being used to very, uh, to very quickly push it deep into the Ukrainian rear. But just to reiterate, based on a, a lot of the movements that we're seeing here, whether it be in relation to Tukronia, where we don't have an update as of now, or whether it be with Salidova, you can see the Russians really are trying to avoid the urban confrontations. That's what allows them to have lower casualties, and then that allows them to continue the fighting for even longer. Uh, the hope is right now with Tukronia, it's twofold, as we talked about in earlier videos. Both the cutoff here and the rest of the nearby uh, sort of western bank of the Vavcha River off from the nearby Ukrainian forces in larger uh, open areas. And then also to get control of a very strong southern flank of Selidovit to sort of squeeze out the, uh, the Ukrainian defenders that have been able to dig in in this uh, Solana River Valley area. And then the issue is you have this really large open field and perhaps some of it is now um, well, more well fortified than it is on the earlier iteration of the trench map. I'm marking it in X. It's just south of Pokrovsk. It is a really good opportunity if Selidovo were to fall to push through here and then put pressure on the Pokrovsk from the southern flank, which would help precipitate the fall of it faster than it would if you just advanced directly head on from the east as uh, the Russians have not really done so far. They've been engaged in clearing operations near trenches, but they've not committed a huge amount of their offensive capacity towards storming directly into Pokrovsk. A lot of it is going on southwards, and I think it's for this reason to get control over this large open field region. A lot of it on heights, uh, but it really depends. The point is it's an area that armored forces could go through quickly, dismount troops, and the troops will already become enmeshed in the uh, vast amount of tree lines here. At the same time, as we said before, various uh, fabs or uh, other bombs are being dropped on top of Krovsk itself. Yesterday, it was like nine targeting uh, the wider structures of the city itself, trying to degrade it that way. 80% of the critical infrastructure is damaged in Pokrovsk, and there's about 13,000 people left. I think that's probably 20, 25% of the uh, pre-war population. And then there's like another 40K that live in Mjernohrad, and I don't know how many of them are left. It's even closer to the front line, so I'd assume a smaller percent. But yeah, really my point is the Ukrainians are looking uh, more into the long term. It's not... Uh, that's far away, you could say, because it is 40 kilometers in the sense that you're going to have longer range artillery soon being within the range where they could fire upon the Ukrainians that are building those, especially following the fall of Pokrovsk. If that were to happen before the Russians reach the border between the two oblasts, then that would give them an amazing location through which to fire artillery, uh, you know, the far farther range ones, mid range, 30 kilometer plus towards those positions. And of course, uh, perhaps TOS, TOS 1A fire, all of that is important. I think the Ukrainians are starting late because they had more confidence in their Vavcha River defense line, and that's going to prove to be uh, long term a really huge uh, loss for the Ukrainians. The fact that they had to retreat from this region so quickly, the fact that the Russians were able to break through through an opening in the Ukrainian defense in Prokhorez and Vavcha. It completely overwhelmed all of these Ukrainian structures that could have been utilized to drag out fighting, and in many cases have. They've been able to save a lot of cities and buy a lot of time in cases where they were actually a man in their entirety. But when they aren't, the Russians pounce upon that, and that's what precipitated a really large collapse throughout the summer months, especially in August. And the Ukrainians just weren't uh, aware of that, so they thought that had more time than they actually did. And now they're realizing, and it's a bit too late now, but they are now actually beginning to expand those to a large degree. Now to zoom in, we had an interesting incident over the skies of Kosyantanivka and nearby villages. You had a Russian Suhoi 57 shooting down an S-70 Hotnik B unmanned combat aerial vehicle. Also in English referred to as uh, the Hunter. It's supposed to go in tandem with the Sioux. 57 in operations, although so far it really hasn't been used. I think that they began the operational, uh, you know, planning and construction of this in 2011, and then actually it was finalized in 2019. Since then, there's only been a very small, small quantity confirmed uh, to be uh, fully constructed by the Russians, although it really hasn't been used in the war. It may have been used once last year in Sumy to uh, engage in reconnaissance, but uh, hasn't really gone deep into the Ukrainian territory uh, really at all. It's only confirmed that there are between three and four S-70s that are actually fully built, although there was reporting earlier this year that 
by the second half of 2024, there would be a large scale production. And so right now, this may be the, uh, what we saw this incident may be a part of the final stage of testing for the S70. Uh, where it actually goes in with an S with a Su-57 into Ukrainian airspace, and they try to see if they can coordinate together. So if that's the case, then this time it failed. Uh, the biggest issue with the S-70 uh, would be its communication systems with the uh, actual uh, mother aircraft, the, the Su-57. Uh, apparently, at some point during their flight, they lost connection and... Of course, there's a fear that then it crashes somewhere, the Ukrainians intercept it, and then they're able to get very sensitive information about the engine and about the components and all that. So that's why it was eventually shot down. That's what's uh, the general narrative being talked about by Russian sources, that they had to shoot it down in that case. And so the Russians shot down their own S-70. It fell in Ukrainian territory, I believe. There was a photo of a Ukrainian soldier standing atop the uh, wing, and the wing itself appears to be uh, pretty much... Uh, like intact in a lot of cases, but the rest of the airframe does look completely destroyed, including the engine. So I don't, I don't know. I guess they'll try to see if they can get vital information. We, we don't know for now. It has a 20 meter wingspan, the S-70. It's a really massive uh, uh, UAV or UAC, whatever it's called, UCAV. And it has a weight of between 20 to 25 tons, just absolutely massive. And then the entire idea is that it's supposed to be low uh, observability in that it uses these various composite materials. So now the uh, Ukrainians are going to have some analysis of that. Uh, what's interesting is the Ukrainians, even though it was 13 kilometers into their airspace, they were not able to identify it first with their radars and then shoot it down. Eventually, it was the Su-57 that did that. And so the fact that two of those aircraft were able to make it into an area that's rather sensitive, like Kostantinivka, it's, is a really important rear city. Uh, that led to some concerns about the availability of Ukrainian air defense in the region. Uh, and so, yeah, there's a lot of implications that can be taken away from this incident. And I'm really going to be interested to see if now this means the introduction of the S-70 more broadly into uh, operations, although I think it'll be phased in uh, over a gradual period of time with uh, small numbers. We don't know anything about the production numbers for the second half of 2024. Now, to zoom in on Toretsky, we're going to see here a slight Russian advance. i um, uh, marking it for you guys in yellow. It amounts to a very small chunk, but it is just, again, continued Russian advances within the center of the city along the same axis. Clearly, the goal is to reach this region here. It's uh, I'm going to mark it for you guys. Just this massive space that includes two huge landfills you could say there's even a third one here and then also these massive industrial facilities if the russian ground forces could just simply push their way through every day advance a couple hundred meters through ukrainian heavy grenade drops or fpv strikes or house to house fighting if they can do that and just ignore the rest of the front line here just not initiate assaults over there and actually just get into here take control over it that would allow them to really undermine ukraine's defense getting full control over this area, although it would be a very thin line between the uh, more, um, you know, solid Ukraine-Russian positions within the eastern suburbs of Toretsk, having this control would be uh, really significant. It would be a massive vantage point that overlooks the entirety of the remaining Ukrainian positions in Toretsk that you see marked with red axes here, and also cutting off the Zabalka district to the south. It would overlook these other Ukrainian villages located westwards along the rail line that runs northwards and actually supplies Toretsk itself. And so, yeah, it could be a way to very uh, quickly, in comparison, push forward and force the Ukrainians out, squeeze them out of certain areas, gain a really important local advantage. Uh, that's what the Russians are doing. They're not really focusing on any broader front. It's really all concentrated on this one particular area. Looking at Kursk, we're zooming in on the Glushkovo district. You can see here a new video released by the Ukrainian 47th Mechanized Brigade, specifically its strike drone company of an FPV destroying a Russian BMD-2 that was parked near a forested area. Maybe this means that only the drone company was moved over, but it, there is a certain indication that the 47th Brigade entirely was moved there. Uh, there were earlier reports back when the a uh, Kursk operation was only beginning that the Ukrainians were planning to move it in at some point. Uh, and now it appears that it's reached that uh, specific uh, movement because, you know, for about a month they've been in rest. They were rotated out and replaced by the 93rd Brigade in the Pokrovsk region. And there was a really a well-deserved break because for over a year they had been fighting in that region and also in Zaporozhye. 
now they've received some level of rest and they're being moved to help with offensive activities in Glushkovo. The Ukrainian plan, it consisted of a strike force of the drone element of the 116th Brigade, 21st Brigade over here, 95th Air Assault Brigade also involved, uh, 225th Assault Battalion. They were all supposed to work in conjunction and break through the borderline over here, advance along this road and reach Glushkovo, cut off the Russian forces that were uh, located here. And that would be their way of counteracting uh, the Russian presence that really continued in Koronovo. A lot of it was degraded by the fact that the Russians were able to create a large breathing space between the Glushkovo River, or not the Glushkovo, but uh, the river over here and the Seam River and the line of contact through their offensive activities towards Obokhovka. Those have sort of stalled right now and stabilized, but it is still it, uh, more advantageous for the Russians due to the fact that now they have a more steady line of connection between all parts of the Kursk front line. Uh, so the Ukrainians really did try to shift focus towards Glushkovo, taking over Veseloy. Some Russian sources talk about counterattacks in the direction of Veseloy, but nothing can be confirmed right now. They also mentioned that in Medvedev, there was a combined Russian effort that allowed them to retake that area and the nearby gully, and that it was conducted by the 1,427th Territorial Motor Rifle Regiment, and over here, the 50, uh, not 51st, but 56th Air Assault Regiment. So now if the 47th really has moved in, it will be very interesting to see if they begin to utilize their tank battalion and a lot of the Western weaponry that they first utilized during the 2023 counteroffensive with this area over here. It's a relatively open area, but now they're coming into an area where the Russians have had several weeks to prepare for any sort of Ukrainian escalation in terms of offensive activities. Uh, and that includes also the 155th Brigade. They're also stationed around here, especially in Glushkovo. As a reminder, the 47th Brigade also includes at least six battalions, uh, plus the fact that they have these various, very small drone groups so connected together. Uh, at least on paper, it should be a large unit, but we all know what happened yesterday when we talked about the 72nd Brigade and their seven battalions, in spite of the fact having uh, very, very small percentages, nothing being at full capacity. And so it's probably not as bad with the 47th Brigade because they have had a bit of rotation and they weren't at Vukhodar the entire time. But it can't be uh, that much different in the sense that they engaged in very heavy fighting in Zaporozhye, then didn't have much time to rotate and were moved into Halvali fights in Avdivka and from there in Pokrovsk. But that's all for today. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.